Okay, thanks for the introduction, first of all. And, and I, um, as I, we've just been told, I've got great backup here and they're on the front row. So if you have any questions for me and I can answer them, these guys will, I'm sure, and they'll be around afterwards for any uh, networking events as well. So we are a British manufacturer. Um, our product is uh, on that first slide there. We make carbon ceramic brake discs for cars, mainly. Um, there's a picture on the next slide. I'll show you where they fit on our car in case you're not familiar, familiar with how brakes work on a car. Uh, we're located up in Liverpool in the northwest. And uh, we've been, as we said, we've been doing this for over a decade uh, in development. And that's, that's a sign of how difficult this product is to design, create and manufacture. Uh, but we're very pleased to where we are now. We've, we've had a transformational year in effect, and that's not a pun on the name, but it has happened, and we've announced a number of deals this year, and I'll talk you through all of that, as well as the market as well. So let's start with uh, what we do. Um, there's a picture of a, an exotic-looking car up there. Um, our market is luxury and performance cars. Um, our product, as I say, sits inside the wheel of that there, so it sits in all four corners of the car, so they're all wheels all round. And uh, alongside a caliper, and the caliper is usually a bright colour, you can just see a little bit of yellow inside that wheel. A caliper activates some brake pads which squeeze against the uh, brake disc. We manufacture the brake disc, and uh, for performance cars, we're really, the market is about replacing iron rotors. Now, iron rotors have been around for 50 years on cars. And uh, this disruptive technology of carbon ceramic brakes is what's changing the marketplace in terms of the performance in luxury car market. What are the uh, reasons for changing a, a brake from iron to a carbon ceramic? Firstly, we've got uh, brake performance. Um, we talk about consistent braking across all the environments you might encounter in the car. So right from driving around town, right up to more spirited and high performance driving, whether you're driving on a track or on a road at night. Um, and we talk about consistent braking. You'll experience brake fade um, if you're at high temperatures on iron rotor where you lose the pedal and it's quite disconcerting <laughs> if you're trying to press the pedal and there's nothing there on your car. Uh, we talk about weight reduction. Um, iron rotors versus a carbon ceramic rotor. Uh, there's a 50% weight reduction when you swap the light for light part from the two. Now that equates to about five, six kilos per rotor. You multiply that up by four for a car. So we talk about a 20, 25 kilo weight saving for swapping an iron rotor for a carbon ceramic rotor. That's significant in its own right because it's unsprung mass, it's hanging off the chassis and it's also rotating mass because the wheels rotate. But it's more important than that. If you can take weight out off the chassis, <coughs> you can then design in slimmer uprights, slimmer suspension, slimmer components that feed into the car. We talk about saving about 5%, so about 100 kilos off the car. Now, 5% off the car's weight gives you fantastic improvements in handling, comfort and refinement, and also the emissions. So if you talk about uh, how you reduce the emissions, you can do that with uh, the powertrain and the engine, but you can also do that by reducing weight on a car, and that's quite a very, becoming very important. It's a wear part on a car, so iron rotors wear out relatively quickly. We talk about ceramic rotors. We can talk about ceramic rotors lasting the lifetime of the car, uh, so they don't become a wear part. But it really depends on the driving. Um, there will be some people out there that can destroy anything um, if they wish to. So if you're driving on normal road conditions and normal driving within the speed limits and so forth, they probably last the lifetime of the car. But if you're driving it in a more spiritedly and on a track, we talk about it lasting four times the life of an iron rotor. But nonetheless, it's very significant improvement in life. Let's talk about the aesthetics. They don't corrode. So in terms of the brake disc, if you see any rain on the car, and it's been out in the rain and left there, you'll see that rust starts to appear on your iron rotor. Um, that can be unsightly. It doesn't look very good uh, for a high performance or luxury car. It can also cause galvanic corrosion where you can get the brake just seizing against the brake pad. We don't see that on a carbon ceramic. More importantly, it doesn't generate as much dust as a traditional iron rotor and pad will make. Now that's important because it doesn't get the wheels dusty and people like their wheels to look clean, but it's also becoming an environmental issue in terms of brake dust becoming a, um, something that the regulations are starting to focus on to say, we'd like to reduce the amount of brake dust that's deposited on roads. 
And as I said at the start, that these yellow calipers, they're normally accompanied by a lime green yellow caliper, and that makes it instantly recognisable that the car has ceramics on it. So there's a prestige to having a carbon ceramic brake, and you can spot it straight away by having a bright caliper on there. And it's got this high-tech, recognisable image. And as I say, not that... Not at the bottom there, I talk about the braces again, and it's an environmental improvement that we can reduce that brake pad dust. So those are the reasons for swapping out an iron rotor. I don't talk about it on here in terms of the text, but there's a cost difference between an iron rotor and a ceramic rotor, and it's why we only talk about the performance and luxury car market. If I try and give you a... Iron rotors have been developed over 50, 60 years, and the cost of an iron rotor has come down to be very competitive. We don't see a ceramic rotor ever trying to compete against an iron rotor in terms of the marketplace, which is why we don't talk about this product getting up, up on a Ford Focus or a Ford Mondeo, that type of car. It's typically four, maybe four to six times the cost of an iron rotor, so it isn't going to end up penetrating that part of the market. But it is. All the benefits that I've talked about here are more, are more than enough for all of the vehicle manufacturers to put it on the high-end cars that, we're, that we, we talk about. Now, if I talk about those high-end cars and talk about defining the marketplace, we, we define that marketplace by the retail price of the car. Cars above 50,000 to, say, 75,000 as a retail price can withstand the cost of a ceramic on <coughs> the main braking axle, typically the front axle. Um, so there'll be two rotors per car on those. And cars above 75,000 and upwards would take it on all four corners. So there'd be four on those. And when you take out the volume of those cars in those two segments, add those up and times it by two and four. We have a future sale price that we don't sell today for, but we know that's where the, the market is going. It comes to about four million rotors, and that in total comes to about a two billion pound market. So although we don't talk about it going into the main volume market, we're very happy to be focusing on a two billion pound market in terms of the market we can address. Now let's talk about some competition and just talk about the market landscape. Um, I know in the introduction there, Keith said it, there aren't many suppliers in the world. I need to, there is one de facto competitor to us today, that is the de facto standard. Um, they manufacture about 200 brake, carbon ceramic brake discs a year. Uh, their revenues is circa 140 million pounds. And they supply all of these guys that I've got down at the bottom here. Now, one thing that's unusual in the automotive market is having one single source of a component and no competition. And that's really where we come in. So in terms of when you're looking around the world for alternative supplies, incredible alternative supplies of carbon ceramic brake discs, that's where we talk about ourselves and being the only credible alternative in the world. I am aware that there are some companies in China, Korea, um, parts of, of, of uh, Europe as well that talk about having technology. But in all honesty, I know them very well. I've seen them all. I've, I've talked to the owners they're not very credible in terms of having a product for the market. So we really do talk about this market being ourselves as well as our competitor, Brembo SGL, as being the two players in that marketplace. And that's what we positioned ourselves. So in terms of position for this market, not having competition, not having an alternative source, not being able to grow that market in terms of capacity, um, all of these OEMs down here, these vehicle manufacturers, are determined to create that competition. And there's a pull from these guys to pull through a competitor and create that competitive environment. And that's where we've, we've been working on for a number of years and we've had those breakthrough contacts that I'll talk about in a little while um, with, with some of these guys down at the bottom. Now, let's just talk about the strategy of the business. Um, I've touched on it already. We want to be world class. Uh, we have a world class product. We want to be a profitable manufacturer of our product, which is carbon ceramic brake discs. And we also do what we are design responsible for these parts. So in terms of what we do, we don't just manufacture them. We design them. And we have the expertise and the knowledge and, and the know-how how to engineer them to make them work on a car. Now, I've talked about the market. Our customers are clearly the OEMs. We talk about being a tier one supplier. There are some cases where we are a tier two supplier, where there's a system integrator that integrates the brake system. We have one example of that, but in the majority of cases, we typically supply direct to the vehicle manufacturer as a tier one supplier. And in terms of the, the contract pipeline we talk about, our customers are telling us their, their potential demand in terms of what they use for carbon ceramic brake discs. And when we use a typical selling price for the future, it comes in at well over 50 million pounds per annum. Now, talk about our product, and I'm, here I'm comparing it to our competitors, the Brembo SGL product rather than an iron rotor. 
Um, our product we talk about is superior to our competitor. And in a, in a nutshell, really, we make plywood. So we have long carbon fibers that, that move through the part and create strength. This is our competitor who makes chipboard, where they chop up that fiber and, and then pour it into a mold and set it. And we also have a very highly ordered material around those fibers, which give us very good thermal properties. And what brakes are about, and it's a very hostile environment for brakes, is about being durable and being able to handle convert the conversion of energy from kinetic into heat. So they get very hot and they have to last in those environments for a long, long time. So having high strength and having high thermal conductivity results in a much better product than our competitors. However, when, you talk, when we talk about price and we look at the cost of manufacture here, although we're relatively small compared to our competitor today, where they make, they make 200,000 brake discs, uh, we think we're competitive on costs, um, particularly on the capital cost in terms of equipment. And that's because when you, when you break it down to the processes and the materials involved, we're very similar in terms of the materials. We both use carbon fibres. We both put more carbon in there. And we both put silicon. They're the fundamental ingredients of the carbon ceramic brake disc. So they're the same. Um, however, the processes are slightly different, but our processing costs we know are very similar to what they do in terms of power, use of labour, use of machining tools and the like, and therefore we can say we're competitive. And we actually have an edge in terms of the capital costs because we don't use moulds. So there you have to create a tooling charge for moulds. We just create a programme that a machine tool des is designed for and then machines the design we want out of it. In terms of quality, it's important in the automotive industry, this is a safety critical part that we're certified to all the quality standards. We are, um, and we maintain those standards. And the other key requirement that our customers want is supply chain and capacity. In terms of the supply chain, we need to be independent. We need to, we've highly integrated our supply chain, so we only buy in fibre uh, from our supply chain, and that's a, a precursor to the carbon fibre we need. So it's a, it's a commodity product, so it's available, re readily available. We then buy in silicon, that comes straight from the mine. And then our other raw material is, is additional carbon, and that comes from natural gas, the stuff you use for your central heating system, so it's a utility. So we're well, we're well integrated and we're secure for our supply chain. And in terms of capacity, what we've been working on over the last couple of years or so is building capacity, our first, if you like, mainstream OEM manufacturing cell. We've made that investment. We have a small manufacturing cell to go with it for our smaller company, smaller businesses with our customers. So we talk about having capacity for revenues up to 16 and a half million. But now importantly, our footprint at our facility is expandable. Um, and we've designed the manufacturing cells to be modular so they can be replicated. So we talk about getting our footprint up to 100,000 discs and that's where we talk, then can enable ourselves to deliver the 50 million pound per annum revenues that our customers talk about. Now, I mentioned at the start, it's been, a, it's been a, a good year, transformational year for us. And what we've been able to talk about now is the contracts that have come through this year and how that's created our contract roadmap and pipeline. We've put it in a sort of a graphical form here and we're trying, to, we're trying to look out past 19 into 2021 and 22. Um, I should say we have an existing business where we developed our product with what we call near OEMs and our retrofit business. A near OEM is a, is a, a vehicle manufacturer that makes perhaps 50, 100 cars a year, so isn't a mainstream um, manufacturer. They are very interested in developing new technology, so they were ideal for us to, to partner with as we were developing the product over the last decade. So we have existing recurring business with these near OEMs. We have about five to 10 of these guys who, who put our product on their cars. Um, and the retrofit market is where we offer a, our superior product to someone who's already got a car with perhaps ceramics on or wants ceramics on there, and they can buy ours as an upgrade kit. So they can buy it from us directly or through our distribution network and then put it on their car and get the performance benefits of a ceramic. So that's recurring business. We've been doing that for a number of years and we see that continuing. It's worth about one and a half, perhaps growing slightly, so maybe two million a year. We announced before this year that we were on the Aston Martin Valkyrie. That's the, the car I showed you at the start, the very exotic looking car. Um, that's worth about one and a half million per annum. It runs over about one and a half years. And we should see that the revenue starts to come through in 2020 and 2021. Now this year we announced a new contract with, and I apologise, I use these, <coughs> these sort of code names, OEM, 6, 5, there are, we, 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 
are very sensitive to our customers' uh, confidentiality. They like to keep things secret from their competitors so they don't know what they're doing. Um, this is a British car manufacturer. Um, OEM6, we were able to announce that we're on their next car. Um, and the development revenue should start in 2020. So we were selected this year, development revenue 2020, 2021, with series production starting at the end of 21 and really kicking in in 2022. That's worth just under 2 million per annum, and that'll run for three years. So we're talking about contracts now that don't just are multi-year contracts and are secure. We then announced, I think in the middle of the year, um, a contract with OEM5, similar time scale. So we, we announced it within, a few, I think, a month or so of OEM6. <coughs> similar time for the, we, for the development revenue we receive as they integrate and develop the car. And actually, it started at a similar time in terms of series production and is at a similar value, so it's just shy of 2 million per annum. That car, however, runs for, I think, about six to seven years in terms of its series supply. So we talked about a contract value here, I think, and this is a European uh, car manufacturer of about 12 million in total, 12 million euros as a contract value. We also announced the Koenigsegg. These guys are a small OEM, but they're becoming more and more mainstream in terms of who knows them and so forth. And they announced this on their new car, which is being developed right now through 2020 and should be launched at the end of 2020. And again, that's worth a, a recurring revenue of just short of about 300,000, just about shy of half a million. And that's recurring for another three years. So when you add up, and I should talk about the last one here, this was announced, I think, a few months ago with OEM1, another British car manufacturer, relatively small, but this is the first, if you like, we hope of a future business that we will win with them. They announced a special car that they were doing with our brakes on worth about £400,000 a year. This has all happened in the last six months really, so what that's allowed us to do is, 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 is demonstrate, if you add all those up, they come to just shy of £6 million. So it demonstrates now how we are going to reach profitability. So all that investment we've been making over the last 10 or so years, we're now seeing to come through in terms of moving through cash generation. Cash generation should start in 2020 through 21 and then we'll become profitable in 22 with these multi-year contracts that we've got. And as I say, this is the beginning for us in terms of what we want to do. To give you an idea of what our customers are talking to us about in terms of their future demand, and just talking about the customers, that, first of all, that we've announced contracts with, OEM5 demand they're talking to us about is over 20,000 discs per annum. And I should say with OEM5, <coughs> We're in quite detailed discussions with them for their future models, so much so that we, we have detailed a pricing matrix that looks at, as their volumes increase, how the price can be moved to where we think they should think it should be. OEM6 is, a, is a over 10,000 discs per annum, again, which will be layered as you introduce the next model and the next model after that with these multi-year contracts. It adds up to about 10,000 discs a year. And similarly with OEM1, we've only just started with OEM1, but their demand is over 15,000 discs a year. Now, I haven't mentioned OEM 3, 2 and 5, but that completes the series of 1 to 6, if that makes sense, in our code. Um, we, we lump these together because OEM 2, 3 and 4 are all part of the same group. They are car manufacturers in their own right that you would recognise, but OEM 3 is given, is given the lead in terms of bringing us on as a supplier. Um, and then once we are brought on as a supplier by OEM 3, it would then be offered up as part of their parts bin to OEM 2 and 4. Clearly, they're, they're one of the big guys in the marketplace with a, with a demand of well over 100,000 discs. Now, what do we need to do to continue that success we've had this year uh, with the selection criteria? For, firstly, for OEM 1, 5 and 6, our product's already approved. It's already being used on cars, so we're through that product approval stage. It's available now for their selection in terms of product that's in their parts bin. As I've touched on earlier, pricing's well understood. Remarkably, we've known the pricing and the pricing elasticity curve in terms of volume and price for the last six, seven years. It's not changed, and that's a function of it being a monopoly market. We, we have our planning for a, a future price, which is not what we sell for today, but our pricing is well-defined and understood by our customers and is agreed. We're talking... Yeah, OK. Talk about capacity. Well, I've talked, I've touched on building the capacity. It's already there. Um, now we're trying to fill it and we've got the modular structure in, in place to add new modules. And the key for us is being, a, is being a good supplier. Now that we've got those contracts and we're supplying, it's about keeping going and making sure we deliver to their requirements. 
I'll touch, I'll touch on OEM3 is I've, I've highlighted slightly different. There is a product requirement that we still need to achieve to be selected, and it's this environment. It's a very strenuous and destructive environmental test. We think we're close, but there's a little bit more work to be done before we can be selected in terms of product for that. <coughs> so I'll just focus in on operational, and then that's me done, and then I can summarize if, you, if that makes sense. So in terms of price and then cost reduction, we have pricing in place. We've worked very hard on our cost reduction so we can achieve good margins. We achieve good margins today. We expect that to continue and we've built in some cost reduction to achieve good margins for the future pricing and volume we expect. And we'll see that continue. Cost reduction never stops in the automotive industry. It's all about cost reduction in the future. We have very good ideas and actually detailed plans for how we'll continue to drive down the cost and see the uh, the volumes grow and the, and the margin being maintained. On the product, our focus is on the completion of environmental tests, principally for OEM3. It's not required for the others, but we want to get that done. And as I say, in terms of capacity, I've given you a floor plan here. This is our complete site. Um, we've got our small volume cell. That, that's good for about four and a half million pounds in terms of revenue, and that services both the development and near OEMs and retrofit. And then we've got our first OEM cell here, which is coming on stream at the end of this year. It'll be in two phases. Um, we'll bring first phase on at the end of this year, and then through 2020, it'll, it'll come into the full, full capacity available. And that's worth about 12 million in terms of revenue. Hence why we talk about having a site worth about 16 and a half million in capacity. But you'll notice we can then add cell two here, three, four, and five. Um, and then if you, they'll, they'll do 20,000 discs each. And hence, we can talk about a capacity of 100,000 for the footprint. Now, to do that uh, capacity build, we talk about the investment being about 10 million uh, per cell, and it's about an 18-month payback in terms of uh, that investment. So, just to summarise, and then we'll take questions. We have had a transformative year. Uh, we've announced contracts with both OEM5, 6 and 1 and Koenigsegg, um, and we expect more to follow. That's allowed us to talk about this now solid contract roadmap with multi-year recurring revenues. Those revenues take us through cash break even and profitability over the next couple of years. And that's principally driven by, uh, by Valkyrie and OEM1 and then Koenigsegg and then obviously the bigger multi-year programs with OEM6 and 5. The keys going forward to continue the success and win more contracts for more models is to be that good supplier and also to complete those environmental testings for OEM3 and operationally is to maintain those margins, improve our costs by further cost reductions on the processes, and then build further capacity. But as I say, we already have capacity for circa 16 and a half, 17 million. Okay. I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, uh, my question revolves around your ability and capacity to upscale yeah. into, this rev uh, into this demand. So, for instance, do you need, for when you bring cell one on, to, again, re-qualify the product that comes off of cell one? It's, it's, a really good, yeah, it's a really good question. The answer is no. The reason for building the cell ahead of time, if you think about... The start of production for OEM 5 and 6 is towards the end of 2021. So we are building that cell now so that we don't have to requalify. If we did it in, say, late 21, we would then have to do some validation work to prove off those, that equipment. But it's done as part of the development program. When it comes to uh, the scaling up of your operation, mm -hmm. what is it you need? You can, you can put the capital investment in, but, you know, what, what do you need? Personnel of a certain qualification? Um, the scale-up is, is principally capital and power. We, uh, you know, the, in terms of skills of, of personnel, yes, there's a level of engineering, but a lot of that engineering is being done on cell one, so it's a replication of that cell, if that makes sense. In terms of scale-up and processing, that's already been done. In terms of people and resource, we don't actually use a lot of labour. A lot of these processes are automated, they run without labour requirements, so the cell doesn't suck in a lot of labour. It's purely down to the capital and, and building for the demand of the customer. Okay, one final question, please. Um, you say you've built in a, a cost decline, uh, sorry, a, a cost and a price decline curve. Absolutely. Can you 
give some indication of, let's say, the cost of a disc today, if that was 100? Yes. Where you're expecting the cost of that disc to be in, say, three years' time? Or four years? In four years, well, can I, I can give it, I, I'd go along, what you've got to realise is that there's a long, these programmes run for seven, seven, typically seven or eight years, so rather than do it in three years, that's probably not the right horizon for a start, but if I give you the, the same metric in terms of 100, it will go down by a third. <coughs> but in return for that, that's where the volumes come, where you talk about 100,000 discs. So, um, and that, that we expect to happen over perhaps five to seven years, but it's not, it isn't that short term, if that makes sense. Thank you. You said that yours cost about four times the cost of an uh, iron rotor mm -hmm. to install per car. What does that make the cost per car for, um, for your product? Um, I'm not sure I can, without, are you talking about? The average. The average, okay. Um, can I put it in a function of the cost of the car, if that makes sense, so rather than telling you an absolute finite number? Where we, th where we, where we are today, the cost is probably, 4% of the car, okay, to give you an idea. Um, where we think we're going, we use the example of an alloy wheel as the, as the good example here. When you tick the box to have a particular alloy wheel, that's a couple of thousand, maybe 3,000 for alloy wheels. That's where we're going. If you were to tick, and to give you another example to try and give you a bit more, if you tick the option today, on, and I'll use a Porsche as an example, where you say, I like the car and it's got an option for the ceramics, you'd pay about £6,000. So it, it's going to halve, if that makes sense, in terms of the future. Also, what are the barriers to entry? Um, is there any intellectual property or whatever covering functionality, design, or manufacturing process or anything like this? Sure. Uh, th there's a mountain of intellectual property. It's not, it's not necessarily in patents. We do, we do have a, a few patents. But the product can't be reverse engineered, first of all. You can't, it's not like a molecule in chemistry where you can go and analyse it and say, that's what we've got. Once it's made, it's made. It's a bit like baking a cake in that regard. You, you know what's in it, but you don't know how it was put there. And our process is incredibly knowledge intensive, know-how in each process. You know, we were very fortunate to give a capital markets there a few months ago and we gave people a tour around. And each, at each process, there's probably 20, 30 secrets, know-how bits in each one. And then you go through the process and say, and there are about 20 processes. So the, the combination of knowing exactly what to do is, is part of the reason why it's taken us so long to get here, if that makes sense. Um, but it's, it's incredibly vast. Yeah, two, two quick questions. Um, none of the <clears throat> OEMs that you list are American. Do Americans not use American car manufacturers not use ceramic brakes? We, well, okay, another good question. Most of the, they do. So the simple answer is yes, they do. Um, but if you look at the market as a whole, 90 plus percent of the performance luxury car market is either in is mainland Europe, Germany, and the UK. There is a small amount in the US. That's not to say we don't talk to them, we do, but they're a smaller part of the market. Yeah, that leads nicely on to the second question. Is one of your, is the ambition for you to build one of your cells and manufacturing capability closer to the OEMs, say in Germany or Northern Italy? Because presumably these items come in just in time or just in sequence. Um, it, they will do. Not for the, these particular contracts we talk about right now aren't quite like that. But as you move through the different models, it'll become much more just in time and in sequence. Um, the answer is no. The answer is we would, if we're going to build the next facility, we will be building it in a, a low cost energy country. So, you know, interestingly, the US is a low cost energy country. So that would be a, that would be a good example. But so is Norway, for example, or Iceland. I'm not suggesting that's where we'd go. But power is about 25% of the cost to make a part. So it's a, it's a fundamental piece of the puzzle. So hence, if we're going to do something, you can manage the just-in-time bit by 
we could have an assembly, you know, I haven't got the picture, but we could have an assembly plant where you bring the rotor and the bell together to be just in time. But you'd want your, you want manufacture in a low, a low energy environment, low cost energy environment. So do you push solar and wind? I mean, you're in Liverpool, so, yeah. you know, you get a lot of fog. We get a lot of wind, actually, as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the answer is, where do I think this company will be in another five to 10 years time? One of our core competencies will be about, will we be generating our own power? Combined heat and power is something we're looking at right now um, of generating our own power. One of our processes actually has a waste stream of gas, which is, which is highly rich for power, and we're looking to recycle that to generate our power ourselves. So we, we will inevitably become part of a power generation company. Yeah, so I think it might be worthwhile for the audience uh, just explaining the ownership of SGL, uh, Brembo, yeah, and point. the implications of that. Yeah, so you know we have one competitor, first of all, a company called Brembo SGL. That's a joint venture between SGL Carbon and Brembo SPA, and it's, one's Italian, one's German. Um, now, what's interesting about that, also from a, a competitive <coughs> landscape point of view, is that SGL Carbon is, has got a significant ownership by BMW. Not only that, the Quant family, who are the owners of BMW, also have a significant ownership of SGL Carbon. So there's a further issue in terms of the other car manufacturers, in terms of the supply chain and security of the supply chain. Not only is it single source and a monopoly, they're also significantly owned by one of their competitors as well. <coughs> 